as you point out, in the last 25 years, there have only been seven novel, or I don't pronounce it correctly, but these new coronavirus uh, vaccines that have been commercialized. What does that mean? And what does that mean for all of us who are counting on a vaccine sometime next year? Yeah. Hi, Adam. Nice to see you guys. Right. So last 25 years, only seven novel vaccines commercialized, four from Merck, fastest record, also Merck. Also, uh, it's very telling. Merck has been kind of very conservative in their dialogue about the vaccine. So I think as the setup into this section went, we have six years of vaccine work that has been condensed into six months. That's unprecedented, unprecedented amounts of money and time and energy. And as a result, we have 250 candidates for COVID around the world, 30 in clinical trials. And as your last um, slide shows, seven, um, nine are now in phase three. So what this means is there's still a lot of clinical and I would say commercial risk. A lot of people don't talk about the commercial risk, but right now, if you poll the American people, about half would not take the vaccine if it comes out before the election. So now is the time where you go slow to go fast. Phase three is all about that balance between safety and efficacy and getting the dose right. So AstraZeneca going on pause for a safety event and turning it over to the DSMB is actually not a surprise. We should expect that that will happen again as we have 250 candidates around the world and we want to get it right. So I'm, I'm pleased to hear um, that the DSMB is looking at it. I hope that they're very transparent about it because you have a lot of other makers around the world and a lot of other patients and physicians wanting to understand if this is a systemic issue or as said, is it simply a one-off? And Megan, looking at um, you know the different types of vaccines, as I was talking about earlier, the different delivery methods is definitely a concern, but not something that we're seeing a lot about. So, uh, is it something that we could even see, you know, any potential entry of even a phase one by the end of this year? Or are we looking more longer term by next year to see, you know, for the for those patients that can't get an injection, something else? Oh, I know they're speeding up. I mean, you get the flu vaccine uh, by nasal administration or shot. So I think it's a great point, Anjali, because a lot of people don't want to get a shot. So if you have half the public that's concerned about getting it and then you have another cohort that doesn't want to get a shot, I think they will expedite the delivery mechanism. And I would anticipate that you'll see more trials uh, using that methodology because it's been used before. We have the platform to do it. Megan, once we do eventually get a vaccine, I got a, a notice from Apple today to upgrade my operating system so that I could be tracked and it's all tech to COVID-19. Is that going to be necessary once a vaccine is um, is in use? Yeah, of course it is, because you're probably going to need a booster. So let's just say seven vaccines are approved out of 250 and we're in the middle of next year. What vaccine did Adam get versus what vaccine did my mom get? Uh, do you need a booster? When did you get it? How do you track it? So I think you're going to see uh, a lot of digital capabilities kick in to help people manage what vaccine do you get? Are some better for the seniors? By the way, some not all the vaccines are being studied in over age 55 and 65. So what vaccine is most conducive to certain populations? I think there's a, an enormous amount of tracking that'll have to go on. And given the numbers, a billion doses potentially going forward, somebody has to track that and it's impossible to think it would be done on paper and facts. Megan, Dan Roberts here. Uh, when we talk about a vaccine and how much the stock market is anticipating it, obviously whoever has the first kind of widely available one, we're likely to see their stock surge. But uh, I know we've also heard that there's not just going to be one winner here. I'm sure there will be a few different vaccines. But can you explain to us, I mean, that there aren't going to be, you know, five or six winners, right? I mean, how many realistically of these big pharma companies can actually hit the market and then coexist, I guess, depending on demand? It's a great question. When I was looking at attrition rates, I was saying, for example, if there was 250 candidates, you might get seven. So we don't have 250 candidates in phase three right now. So you're right. Not everyone will make it, but it's not a winner take all because this will go on for a while. And also, if you look at the summer, biotech is having a bit of an endless summer because of COVID. So there's a lot of activity around not just vaccines, but treatments. And in fact, the first half of this year, biotech IPOs raised close to $8 billion. And in the first half of the year, the FDA was quite busy. They approved 21 precision oncology drugs and there's a whole raft of COVID activity following on. So I think it's not just, are you first with a vaccine? Are you also going to be involved in some of the treatment and other activity that's going on in the space, which has been incredibly active? 
Megan Fitzgerald it is author of Ascending Davos and also a Columbia University healthcare policy professor as well as a Tom Hanks fan and a fan of the movie Castaway. Say hi to Wilson for us. Good. All the best to you. Thank you so much. Hey, investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well, then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up-to-the-minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance, and information on how to manage your money every day, wherever you are.